Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, episode, we'll call it 900. I have no idea what, how many episodes we've done this. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is a very special evening for us. Uh, Timmy is out in Santa Barbara, um, and he is with some amazing individuals. Um, tonight, we are going to feature uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau, uh, the Ocean Future Society. Uh, I've got all kinds of photography. You can step in anytime, Timmy, and 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 mention people's name, do whatever you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. I want to get us to the point where we we'll start drawing, and then we can introduce people. Uh, these are just some shots that Timmy sent me. These are just fantastic, and it's amazing. We're talking to these people. <laughs> looking at great photo reference of things that they do as explorers or scientists, marine biologists, marine scientists. Um, and um, it's so cool that they're going to be with us tonight. Uh, Timmy has, Timmy and I have a little bit of a side story to tell. Um, and it kind of starts with this. Uh, this is our drawing night. Uh, this is legacy from my father to Timmy's father. To Jean Michel's father, and uh, I, I, you know, I thought about doing. It would be fun if we did just drawings of them, but then I thought, nah, let's 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 focus on, uh, let's focus on our guests. Um, but this is a, a drawing my father did of uh, Jacques Cousteau in 1978. Um, he got involved with, a, I think it was over beers that um, our fathers were having, and they were deciding who would be the the greatest person in the world to make some kind of print with, uh, an explorer, somebody, a hero. And they decided on Jacques Cousteau. And so as my dad tells the story, a week later, Tim calls him from New York and he's at the Cousteau Society. And I just think that that's number one, that's Tim Trabon perfectly, um, uh, willing to just throw himself out there and go out and figure out how to make this thing work. Um, I don't know the exact details. I know that I know that there was some. My father did all all of uh, not all but a lot of uh, John Denver's uh, um, album covers, and John was uh, connected with Cousteau Society or, or had um, offered him some kind of in, uh, uh, introduction. And one one thing I'll ahead. add. Sorry, one thing I'll add is at the time. Jacques Cousteau was listed as the most recognizable man on the planet, yeah. um, which is really astounding. And if you don't know, you know, if you're a younger listener and you don't know who Jacques Cousteau is, anyone you think of who is currently, you know, fighting to pres either ocean preservation or land preservation, um, who are representing the protection of our ecology, all, it all leads back to inspiration from Jacques Cousteau, who in many ways introduced the world to the ocean on television. So uh, like John, I always laugh about like your dad saying like you, they, they landed on, oh, well we should do a portrait of Jacques Cousteau, right? And I think it's like, it's like if I told you we should do a portrait of George Clooney and then your answer was, well, then we just have to become friends with Brad Pitt. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was an absurd thing. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I, that's, a, that's a good analogy. And, and, it is. And, and, and kind of fun. But I, I really wanted to share, I wanted to share this drawing. Timmy shared it in the Drawing Hive um, Discord channel. And I, um, my father was a remarkable drawer. Um, and he was drawing a remarkable man. And um, it just makes me, it makes me happy that we can do this tonight. So um, our pho photography for tonight, and we have a few extra photos in here that you can choose. Um, so the first is uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau, and that's a Nick Vidros photograph, a local Kansas City, famed fam fan city, uh, Kansas City photographer. And to me, I uh, is is very close to Nick, and um, uh, Timmy's father was very close. They were very good friends. Um, so full circle. Mm -hmm. um, second shot. This thing just slays me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I just think about 
uh, my relationship with my sons, my relationship with my father, and that I can hear the conversation right now. So you want me to put this on and then dive into the water and go down. I, I could just hear how all of this, it was being explained to him. Yeah, you're going to be fine. Don't worry about it, son. That was um, experimental equipment. Yeah. Oh, I know. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I just think it's so great that uh, you're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag it was the 60s. <laughs> That's right. It was the 30s. <laughs> Or 30, sorry, yeah, gosh. <laughs> this is a great photo. I love this. They're all smiling. That's mm -hmm. beautiful. All three. And so uh, second pose and our third pose, we have three, four, which this is Jacques and uh, Tim Drebach. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, when I think about the... Um, your father, his legacy, this photograph is embedded in my brain because I always remember just thinking, <laughs> I got this idea over beer and why not? Let's just go meet the guy. <laughs> and then convince him to do it, which is amazing. Um, they said no a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, kudos to your father for making it happen. Um, and then I just thought I would throw this in there for fun. If anybody wants to draw this, knock yourself out. It's um, one of Tommy Shell's favorite animals. Yeah, great photograph, an orca in the wild, uh, great shot. So as every night we do three poses, um, you have a little bit more option tonight, um, but we're gonna do our first two 20 minute poses and then, 30 min then, then the third pose is a 40 minute pose. And then you can post your work to hashtag drawing, drawing hive on Instagram in between poses yeah and i just want to remind everybody we're instead of doing at visual arts passage we're doing at ocean future society it's all on the website if you need the uh, tags let me know all right let's get drawn all right we've got a good crowd too we got raymond bonilla here cassandra kim and bill cope hey bill hey. i didn't see you come in man hey bill hey yeah. hey Cassandra, you're here twice. I know. I, Bill, I'm i Bill, later. Bill, Bill, let some things be behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, just Iman was, I just heard Iman was drawing with this or something. Oh, yeah. No, I need to get him in here one night. Uh, Cassandra is in charge of timing everything tonight, so I'm sure everybody's going to have some pretty long poses. I'm going to step away <laughs> for a few minutes, um, but everybody, I just want to let you know, we've got Don Santi, Holly of Ocean Futures, and then Jean-Michel Cousteau all joining us tonight. They're incredible oceanographers. Come ready with some good questions. They've, I mean, they've, they've led, I was talking with Don Santi, who is, he's largely credited with being like one of the most accomplished divers of all time. And um he's had quite an adventurous life they they're people who have learned how to live life like exactly how they want and i think there's a lot to be learned from that um whether it's obviously it's a great fortune to be able to do that but um i i really admire them so come ready with some get some ocean questions ready get your insp get inspired it's a good one I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys uh, take it from here. I'll be back in a minute with our guests, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm excited. Oh. Anybody else think that uh, that was Timmy's view from from like that that uh, that canvas in the background with the underwater? I thought that was a window outside for a second. <laughs> He's calling from an underwater village. <laughs> yeah. He had like the bust of Jacques Cousteau behind him. And then it made me think of that Halloween. Remember when Dale kept saying he was going to bring a guest and then it was like a stuffed like doll, like person. Or, remember that? I, I, I don't, but that sounds like a Dale Stefano's guess. If That's I've right. ever. He, he talked it up and they were all like, wait, where's the person? And they're like, it's right there. Dale is on the beach on the other side of the ocean right now. Uh, and Martha's Vineyard, <laughs> other side of the United States, uh, celebrating his 59th birthday. 
Oh, hey, I'm I'm popping back in just to say because later we're probably not going to talk too much about drawing. I think now would be a great time to knock out some uh, heavy info on how you're tackling some of these portraits because I'd like to know. Sounds great, um, John. You you want to go first? Yeah. Well, I've been drawing for about thirty five minutes now, forty minutes. And I just wanted uh, to expose you. Uh, I, mean, I didn't look. I didn't look too bad for you know, starting. You got early. this crew showing up. I'm not going to, you know, show up and uh, uh, not be ready. So right. um, I started. I am drawing with two things. I'm drawing with a small piece of uh, charcoal and a charcoal car a Carbothello charcoal pencil, and I put down like a lighter. Uh, I had a harder charcoal, this this one, which is, it doesn't go near as dark. And I put it down first to kind of find the shape of them. And now I'm kind of going in and identifying everything with the darker value. And I hope I don't go too far with it. Uh, don't screw it up. Um, it's, it is, um, it kind of requires, because it's lit kind of equally from both sides. So it kind of requires, for me anyway, to set it up that I got to have a little bit of a background behind it to bring them forward. I'm going to try to get as much accomplished with the line, but I wanted to have some value behind him to um, uh, to pull him forward with that lighting scenario. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not a common scenario to do a portrait. Um, usually you're using like short loop light or um, <clears throat> uh, Rembrandt lighting. To explain the human the human head really well, uh, but this is really quite nice. It makes a lovely photograph, and um, heck, heck, it's a fun subject matter to draw. So that's all I got. Awesome. How about and, you? And uh, what what about you? Uh, well, I'm I'm uh, doing this in Photoshop. My my go to uh, traditional uh, medium, I guess, for for drawing drawing hive. Uh, I'm uh, just laying in this drawing, uh, like like you had said, John. It was you have a dual light source coming from both sides. Really common in comic books, I find. Like I felt like it's like the thing to do. And I was thinking like it's got to be kind of graphic because of that. And this reminds me of kind of uh, uh, also a portrait that I saw, a self portrait that I saw of, of David Grove. And so I kind of wanted to make sure that I had this sort of structural drawing in place. Uh, I basically laid out sort of my major masses. Uh, figured out where my landmarks are, my bony landmarks, orbicular cavities, zygomatic bone, you know, just really roughly trying to use straight uh, lines, not, not too many sort of intricate lines, straight and curves. And then I just built, started building more and more fidelity, uh, more and more smaller uh, poses, uh, forms and refining them. And then I'm going to throw a wash over it and, and then uh, lift it out uh, and then maybe go back in and paint it, paint it opaquely. Very cool. At least that's a plan. Fantastic. So, what about you, Cassandra? Like um, I have um, GAC 100 sealed cardboard. It's my <laughs> favorite drawing hive surface so that the paint can sit right on top. And on top of it is just acrylic paint. And I work silhouette first. I just lay out what I see. And then I rough in just kind of a neutral dark. And then I'm going to just block in and maybe bring in like neutral lights. When I say neutral, I mean not too dramatically dark yet, not too dramatically light. I'm going to try to keep the tones close together while I'm figuring everything out and then slowly sharpen. So for me, I like them to start out pretty blurry and then I kind of render in as I go. Bill, awesome. how about you? Um, I'm using, I'm drawing on um, Stonehenge paper. Um, with a very, very small piece of new pastel because it's the darkest color I have right now and it shows up on camera. And, um, and so I, yeah, I mean, my approach is somewhat, with this is similar to John's. I looked at how John was doing it and I'm like, that that looks like a good way to go. So, um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I'm identifying the big shape of the head and then the, this inner shadow area 
and trying to get that somewhat established. And then once that's down, I want to sort of leave the lighter skin tones and the hair, the hair alone and um, and then just, you know, kind of focus in on the dark. So that's why a lot of this, the bottom is sort of left gone. And uh, and and one thing that's, that's really sort of crucial for me, at least with this drawing, is getting the tilt of his head. Um, it's, a it's, a, it's a tough one. You don't realize it uh, until you start looking at the angle of his eyes. Yeah, and I mean, typically what happens a lot of times when you draw somebody with a tilted head is you you tend to draw them straight on, but then you, you skew the features. And so it's, um, you know, it's good to sort of start thinking about that ahead of time, that this is his head's tilted. And, um, and I'm also, I can't, this is such a small, tool, I can't really make any sort of real precise marks with it to start out because it's just, it's really kind of stubby, but um, I'll probably pick up another, I've got another piece of pastel somewhere that I'll use. Um, I keep meaning to buy an eraser to erase out areas, but um, my cats keep taking them, so, <laughs> you know. So I end up using, um, a lot of times I'll use a light value like this. What is this? Uh, rose coquillage color. And I'll, I'll sometimes establish my light, instead of erasing, I'll establish my lights by doing, by using a light color. If that makes sense. Yeah, I'm gonna be flipping the canvas mirroring my my canvas a lot today to get that tilt and get it keep everything in line with each other because i know i'm gonna i'm gonna need it these usually spell trouble these uh for me <laughs> these these types of portraits yeah they, they, they are tough and, it, and it's what i you know thinking about and you know i feel like i have is I got his likeness pretty well right now. There's some things I got to work on, but then I'm thinking about trying to, how am I going to finish the drawing? You know, what, what am I going right. to do to make it a, an, an interesting drawing or make it, um, you know, a finished piece. And, um, you know, I guess that's the, you know, we're not always trying to do things like super polished and academic. We're trying to make well composed pictures too. And that's kind of where I am right now. Great. Why do you keep mirroring? Somebody was asking. Oh, uh, it's so it gives me a fresher look on my uh, my drawing, because uh, you know, uh, especially with with portraits, I find that um, oftentimes my eye will will just get tired from looking, and, and I get used to the same view, and so it becomes a little bit lazy and um not as critical and so flipping it uh allows me to see it uh in a new uh kind of in a new light and a, in a fresh view so i can and the usually when you do that um you can you'll see your the issues in your drawing really quickly uh, mm -hmm. turn upside down works really well too um, but horizontal since it's the same kind of like orientation it's uh it's really helpful. It's just, just akin to having like a mirror in your studio. Yeah, I definitely have a mirror in my studio. I need to get one. I need to get one. I've been taking photos of my paintings with my iPhone and flipping it horizontally. I mean, like it's pretty jerry-rigged, but. <laughs> I, I got like this old cabinet and the cabinet had the mirror on it so I store a bunch of my art supplies in it and it just it has a mirror and it's it's been so useful that way see that's that's a pro right there John you see, you see that John and Bill it's like dual dual purpose mm -hmm. I got it for a great well, price mother, it's like bright blue you know, <laughs> you know what was that Cassandra Oh, I got it for a great price because it's bright blue. 
<laughs> oh, I like the way that's looking, right? Thanks. It's just like an oil lift out type of thing. And then, uh, yeah, and that that way, if I and that when I inevitably mess this up by doing too much to it, I could just turn the top layers off and then call it a day. Yeah, I wish I could do that. I know, yeah, right? I know. When I inevitably mess this up, I just go to the next one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's start again. It's when I throw my cardboard to the ground and grab a new piece of cardboard. Yeah. Um, so these so types of, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, somebody was just asking, where do I start and what is important parts I should include? Well, you're probably going to have to put the nose and eyes in. <laughs> um, features. Uh, now, I, I again, watch Cassandra. Why, uh, kind of all of us kind of all try to find the shape of it first. Um, I was a little bit further along because I cheated and started early. Um, but the first thing is is figure out where everything goes. Um, get your get find the, you know, find this. I like to find the shape of it. And then I try to figure out proportionally where everything goes, angles of the eyes, angles of the mouth, some some kind of touch points that I can continue that I can use as measurement. Most of my measuring I do in my head after I'm looking at the shape. It's just, you know, it's a it's a real observational way of drawing. I don't have like a super, you know, exact formula of how I do it, except for trying to identify shape first. Yeah, exactly. You know, because you're still one of the biggest... tell so much of it. Sorry. I had the first time I heard somebody say this was it was actually Gary Kelly, great illustrator, great artist. He was in the in the room with a bunch of students and he said, you know, you all need to just simplify what you're doing. And you really just need to understand a picture is a collection of shapes and it's your job to control those shapes on the picture plane. And I just like, you know, my head exploded and I was like, God, I wish I would have said that. And then um and it's like everything I've been trying to do or I've been doing, he just put it all in like a sentence or two. Um, and then, and then that, that's, you know, I, I, I think people try to make it too complex. Um, try to identify the shape. And, you know, there's, there's things you can do to, to, to better yourself technically. Information like understanding what forms principles are. You know, how does light affect an object? You know, what's a what's a cast shadow? What's a core shadow? And those will tell you kind of, you know, this battle of going on of what's hard edge and soft edge. How does light roll over something? And if you understand forms principles, that's pretty much everything you need to know about rendering. That's my theory anyway. Ray's got a lot more information. <laughs> Tap here for more information. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say that, you know, what you and Cassandra are doing, what we're all doing is just working general to specific because and it's often, I think, as when you're first learning uh, to draw, the first thing you have to learn is like how to process the information that you're seeing in front of you. And because uh, we're so attuned to textures and, and patterns early on that we try and make everything we look for the nuance of things instead of uh, what the actual larger sort of most influential uh, forms are. And so this type of stuff, if you're looking at trying to get better at any sort of drawing, uh, not just uh, portraits, try working the big shapes first and really holding off on the small, medium size and small shapes until you you put in the big shapes. And you'll, you'll start to realize that um, the big shapes really carry a lot of a uh, lot of luggage, uh, carry a lot of the weight, the majority of the weight of the drawing uh, or the image that you're working on. It's so true. I mean, I think once you figure out the big things, 
um, and like if you've perfected your silhouette and you've got a reasonable silhouette that you, you know like Ray you've got it really well established and then you just drop those lights in and you can see who it is and so I think by simplifying the way you look at it it makes it so much more accessible too it doesn't become overwhelming you're not rendering a full eye and then trying to make everything match you're just trying to figure out well let's start with head shape let's figure out like generally where the nose is and we'll just kind of drop drop a little bit of shape in there let's figure out where like the eyes are where's the mouth and then it stops being an overwhelming task and it's it's bite-sized steps to make through yeah and you realize like you know we're all professional artists and we're, we're telling people this and it's like you realize the way we learned is because other professional artists told us that and to mm -hmm. you don't have to put all of that uh, uh pressure on yourself to get everything right from the nuance from the beginning it's unnecessary uh and and, and actually not efficient either i mean you could that's the thing about uh that is that it could it can oftentimes take longer much longer uh when working from small to to large because you're the small stuff you're you're putting a lot more emphasis on the smaller things and most of the time you actually end up drawing more inaccurately because uh, you put too much emphasis on the small things like a highlight in the eyes become way too bright, way too large, or the eyes themselves turn too, uh, too large, especially in the portraits or the nose and the mouth, uh, nose becomes too small, and so on and so forth. And you miss sort of the overall theme uh, of it, uh, of the, the image. So if, if you look you at- along with that, Ray, you know, it's like we've, uh, you know, for our mentorship program, we've created some like assignments and approaches that help you control that, you know, our flat assignment, uh, you know, the academy drawing process. And all of it was those two things, especially were my father's observations about people learning and it, saying, doing exactly what you're saying, Ray, is like they go for the polish and finish and they go for the little things first. And he's like, hey, wait, back up get the big stuff right and the little stuff sometimes you don't even need it right sorry I mean, to interrupt you what, <laughs> no no what i was going to say if you look at any of those types of uh the the great pieces of art uh you know look at one of uh your pieces that your father has done uh try don't look at it from up close try and look at it from a thumbnail and you'll see that that is it's just as strong as it is you know from the thumbnail as it is you know the size of your screen and that's because it was it worked general to specific so that's all i wanted to say thanks ray if um you don't have to because i'm not so i don't want to be sound like you have to but um if you it, it's time for the next pose you know one I can't thing, but, be to me and be like, move on, folks. I'm just going to, because I'm not moving on yet. I'm still trying to figure this out. <laughs> you know, one thing about illustration, we have been about this a lot today, because, you know, we've all practiced as illustrators and some of us are working more as fine artists, is that it's really easy to get seduced by the polish and the finish of a thing. But what you're trying to do when you're making a portrait or making a picture of something, is you're, you're by and large trying to convey an idea and or or ask a question. And you know, Gary Kelly's a really good person to think about because um his work is not, I mean, it, it, he can highly render, but his work is very shape-oriented and design and he thinks about what's in his picture i think at least what's in his picture and what's the best way he can convey that and sometimes that's literalism which is sort of what we're we're at right now and sometimes that's um a more graphic approach i mean he just put to two pieces one was very graphic and one was very tonal and they were both very successful but the hard thing I think about doing a portrait like this is that you're faced with this beautiful piece of reference. And so you feel like you want to, I, I at least feel like I want to 
be faithful to the reference, but I but I have to remind myself that a lot of the things that I really like the most are the least literal, least polished uh, images. Um, look at an artist like Alice Neal, or um, I'm trying to think of who's another good example of that. Well, okay, good. everybody, uh, since we're moving on to the second pose, please post uh, your work. I know Cassandra mentioned this already, but I just want to remind everybody, please tag uh, hashtag drawing hive and at Ocean Future Society. So I am back. I've got some new friends <laughs> tuned in with us. <laughs> okay, from uh, oh. right, uh, we've got Don Santi, a uh, world-renowned diver. Uh, I'm left. Uh, so, well, it's it's mirrored, Don. <laughs> Timmy, gonna... you did say they they might be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Don Santi, world renowned diver, uh, head of expeditions with the Cousteau Society. He's had decades working with Jacques Cousteau and Jean Michel Cousteau, as well as Ocean Futures Society. In the middle, we've got our man. Jean-Michel Cousteau. Who's that? <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> the paintings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And then, uh, and everybody's heard plenty about you this week, <laughs> really? leading up to this episode. And how many people fell asleep? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. And then we also have Holly uh, Loheis, who is uh, um, an incredible marine biologist and also a major part of what is Ocean Futures today. So we're going to talk quite a bit about... Uh, some of the goings-ons with the organization that is Ocean Futures. But um, I just, we, I, I want to start this off by saying, I know we have a lot of very young listeners who might have like skipped their history class. And I just want to remind everybody that this is really incredible. And if you, if you look back at, or if you look at all the, the people who are fighting to defend our planet, our water world, um, some of the water animals, this is a water planet. The people that are fighting today, it's easy to forget that all of their inspiration comes from, really, it all leads back to, I believe, only a couple dominoes. And one of those big dominoes was Jacques Cousteau and the Cousteau Society. And so I'm very proud to be here. It was a very important thing for my dad to be part of this. And uh, all the, these three individuals, are, uh, they're, they, they were an incredible vanguard of that moment in history. So... It's really special to get to talk with them. Uh, if you're in the audience, please ask questions on Discord. Uh, I'm sure Cassandra will be, Cassandra, I'm sure you'll be peeking at Discord. Yes, um, yes, I already am. Okay, cool. Uh, and uh, anyways, let's just kick this off. Um, yeah. This yeah. is exciting to have you here. Well, you know, for me, I want to be very clear that I'm here because when I was a kid, I was in the ocean and my dad put a tank on my back. I became a scuba diver. I never stopped. And I was seven years old. These people didn't have to be and do what they're doing today. Why are you doing it, Dan? I had no <laughs> choice, but they have choices all the time. And they've been part of a very, very important mission uh, of uh, my father and now Ocean Future Society which I created after my father passed away. And uh, our mission is to make sure that the public and young people particularly realize that we are connected to the ocean, we depend upon it. And it's a very exciting time because we make discoveries all the time. And I'm not a scientist, so she does. And she makes us discover. And he technically makes sure that we do what we need to do and submarines and equipment and whatever. Hey, I, I have a great team and I love to do it and I'll never, never stop to do that, to share it with as many people who are interested in doing something about the ocean and protecting their future. Protect the ocean and you protect yourself. <laughs> You're falling asleep? How many times I've heard that? <laughs> well, I appreciate hearing the, the it. Thank you so much. Already. It's so fantastic that you all are here. Thank you. I just want to ask, I know the panels, we've been texting all week about tonight, and I just know 
Do, do any of the artists on the panel have any questions tonight? No, they all fell asleep. Oh, no. no, 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 we have not. I've been having fun I mean, drawing them. You all have been a part of an insane amount of documentaries. What What is your favorite documentary or do you feel it was like the most powerful one that you created? You're asking me? Yeah. Not them? You and Don. Uh, yeah. Huh? So what do you, I have no I'm idea sure the most. I've done... I think 40 films with Captain Cousteau, another 15 with John Michel. More than 15. More than 15. Oh, yeah. Um, since my father passed away, uh, you and I and our team, we've done uh, up to 100 shows. Well, they've all been very interesting in different ways. So it's hard to pick one. Um, but I can say this is that with all the time I spent in rivers, oceans, on land, above and below water. There's only one great job in the world, and I had it. Oh, that's so cool. Wow, that's, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the name of your job. Keeping everybody alive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everybody knows what my job is, since we've told them several times already. <laughs> yeah. How did you get the job? Mm. Huh. Um, right place at the right time. They needed a uh, a dive master out here on Santa Barbara Island and Anacatha Island, and uh, each project was a week long. And after that, it turned into a couple of months, and then four or five months, and then eventually full time. So, right place at the right time. And then what? Well, then I said full time. For 40 years, 50 years, whatever it's with who? With you and your father. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you did you ever get tired of being in the water? No, never. Never. No. I have to say that for the team, and you know, sometimes they were up to 20 divers uh, on our team uh, around Cape So and so on. And he has kept us alive. Uh, not having any accidents, and that was uh, in just the, the boats, but mm -hmm. many of the locations in Fiji and uh, uh, French Polynesia and on and on and on. So he's been very critical in uh, making sure that we were able to do what we needed to do to collect the images that we wanted to have in order to share it with the public. That's that's really interesting. One of the things I was thinking about earlier today was because, you know, we're visual arts passage is an art school. And so many of our artists think about how to tell a visual story, how to create compelling images that make a person feel a certain way or believe in something or be inspired. And I feel like so much of the things that you all captured to create inspiring moments relied on intense technical ability. Um, in a high pressure environment, but then also relied on you to tell a, a creative a visual story. And what what do you think that balance was of of technical technical experience and technical application and creative application? Because I felt like you're trying to capture lightning in a bottle. We needed to have someone who was specialized in many of those species which we are not. And thanks to Holly, who is a marine biologist, she was able to connect everything that we were attracted to uh, by explaining what this was all about and for often us doing or behaving the right way. So, right? Right. Um, you said it so beautiful to me in the beginning that we live on this water planet. And I think the privilege, I mean, such a humble experience to sit right here with Jean-Michel and Don and have been diving around the world's oceans for almost 30 years with both of them. I think it comes with a, a sense of, of not only a privilege because we've worked hard to be where we are doing what we're doing. The story we're telling has to be compelling. We need to engage people and we're going to places we know the average person will never get that opportunity to see for themselves. So that is, I mean, Don has trained us on decompression diving, 
diving to 200 feet when we're with 200 reef sharks and Rangaroa in the South Pacific, knowing that, and the two MO2s, we were in Rangaroa, knowing that the global pressure on shark fisheries was increasing dramatically. So everywhere we went was a privilege to see the incredible beauty of the underwater world, but knowing that that story had to be hopefully compelling and convincing and motivating so people care to learn more about the ocean. And that's really Jean-Michel who just inspires us to um, continue that mission. Well, it's, the, the objective was to go, go, go and discover, 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 because still today there are thousands of species we don't know. And if we know some of them, we don't know how they uh, multiple, what, how they behave, uh, how they protect themselves and so on. And it, thanks to you and many uh, people you can connect us with, we're learning a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I've been in love many, many species, but I didn't know. Uh, for example, my favorite creature is the octopus. The octopus has no bones. Whoa, no bones? And are they cold blooded? Uh, kind of cold blooded. They're an invertebrate, Jean Michel. <laughs> they, they have no backbone. <laughs> but they can change color, they yeah, can change texture, they have eight arms, and they can make decisions. And if they're sick and tired of us, they can disappear in a tiny little hole. I mean, <laughs> and for me, I be connected with scientists. I've been learning and learning and learning because when I was a kid, I was catching them to sell them and to make money. But now when I see one, I want to film it. I want to understand his behavior. And that's about thousands of species in the ocean. And that's why we'll never, never stop diving. Are you going to come with me diving when I'm going to be 107? No, I'm going to be dead. <laughs> Why? Because I don't want to live to be 107. Oh, <laughs> what am I going to do? Who's going to take care of me? Well, find somebody younger. Why do you want to go diving when you're 107? Do you want to because tell I want to celebrate 100 years of scuba diving. And uh, to me, it's an honor because thanks uh, to my dad who put a tank on my back when I was seven. Now you have to be 10 years old to be certified. But in those days, there was no certification. And I've never stopped diving. Uh, 78 years of scuba diving, going on to 79 and on and on and on. And I'll never stop. And you always say, where do you put sardines? Sardines? Yeah, when you catch sardines, how do you preserve them? You always say this, Jean-Michel. <laughs> no, you're going to have to say it for me because <laughs> I'm going to say something you don't want okay. to say. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you want to say it first and I'll plug my ears? Or? <laughs> no, no, no. Go for it. He always says salt preserves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but where do you put sardines but in a can of salt water? Yeah, yeah. so, so I, keep diving. And it's uh, horrible because I love sardines. I used to eat them all the time. And, <laughs> That's when, when I was young, uh, all the fishermen were catching sardines nonstop. And uh, that's when I became a connected to it. All right. What are you going to say that I can't go on the Oh, I don't know. Maybe the audience can't hear that either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. Yeah, Bill, what's your question? Yeah. So, I mean, you guys are talking a lot about conservation now. Um, was the focus originally? Was conservation originally in the concept of the exploration or was it purely more exploration and then conservation developed as a result of what you saw? So Jean-Michel, when you were on first expedition with your father and some of the first TV specials in America, conservation was not a theme. It was more about discovery and exploration. Oh yeah, it was sharing the, uh, the excitement of being underwater and seeing things that nobody had ever seen. And, you know, we started in the Mediterranean Sea and uh, Mediterranean Sea is a very, very rich place uh, for the ocean, at least in those days. And uh, I, I was seeing things every day when I was going in the water. And I was going in the water almost every day. 
when I was there because I was uh, near Toulon. My father was based in Toulon, uh, which is a big capital for the French Navy. And uh, I was in the water and I saw things nonstop. Mm -hmm. And today I can go back and, uh, well, I've done a lot of work because I used to see things in the harbor in Sanary where I grew up and then uh, everything disappeared. And I went to see the mayor and I sat down with the mayor and I said, you know, I was a kid and I was looking at all, all kinds of things. Why don't you take care of the water before it gets into the harbor so the harbor can be healthy for any species? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, okay, and he did it. And now you can go and you go to see species of fish, which I used to see when I was a kid. And we need to communicate with decision makers uh, the privilege that we have of being in the ocean and seeing things that nobody has ever seen and make decision makers, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. money or election or whatever. I'm curious. And sit down with them and just share the information. When I started working with you and Don, it was definitely a sense of conservation. So in the 90s, we already knew that we were polluting and overfishing our world's oceans. Yeah. But Don, I'm curious. On expedition, what's a memorable moment when you really realize that the story is more of our connection to it versus just discovering it? Well, it was actually 50 years ago when Captain Cousteau mentioned global warming. And here we are 50 years later and nobody's done a damn thing. Mm -hmm. And David Attenborough was another one 50 years ago who mentioned global warming. And so two very renowned renowned people mentioned it a long time ago. Yeah. And we've done a little bit. Did you see it personally of like a changing Arctic or places you've gone back to of a warming planet? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. we see it all over the place, you know. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But uh, we know what needs to be done, well, most of it. And the good news is that you have 8 billion people on 30% of the planet who are all connected to each other. Uh, with the technology that we have today. And now, whether it's cell phone, computers, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I was a kid, I didn't have a phone. I didn't uh, know, you know. Mm -hmm. So Sorry. now we have uh, no excuse to uh, not connect with everybody who make decisions. And uh, I think we can, uh, we have a chance. We're the only species that has the privilege to decide not to disappear. So it's our choice. If we disappear, nature will keep going on, doing its own thing with whatever is left behind. Mm -hmm. So uh, I look in the eyes of kids today and I say, I want you to have the same privilege that I've had when I was your kids. And uh, that's why I will never give up. That's beautiful. Well, but it's it's, not even beautiful it's it's emotional it's very it's it's a mission and uh we're making progress and thanks to people of the team and the people we work with sometimes 20 30 people on expeditions uh those people want to do the same thing i think that's what Cousteau, both jacques Cousteau, and then of course jean michel really brings that human element to documentary nature stories so mm -hmm. There's a classic scene of Don in the Arctic and he sends off his divers out into the icy cold water and he sits behind on the picnic table and he's like, <laughs> waiting for the polar bears. Remember that, Don? I mean, we all have fun on expedition oh, oh, because... <laughs> I, I, just think, I just think it's interesting because so much of like the artists that we work with, they come to our school, they work with our teachers um, and that we have in as guest speakers. So much of their focus is to inspire feeling. Yeah. And inspiring the right feeling in the right person True. can make a huge difference. I yeah, and we, we we need to help them go and do things that they didn't know they could do. Mm -hmm. And there are more and more people today, thanks to the communication revolution that we're living, that are doing uh, very interesting things. And that's why I'm fascinated by People ask, always ask me all the time, uh, oh, you've been diving 78 years, what, what's your best dive? I always tell them, 
the next one. <laughs> because I see either a new species or new behavior of species. And uh, it gives me a chance to have a story to share. Don, Don't you agree, Holly? Yes. Don, well, Don, I've got a question because the early days of the Cousteau Society, is this guy always this happy? Has he always been this happy? Be careful. This whole time. He's, in oh, yes. he's, he's, he's a laugh in there. Always has been. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think he's so happy? I don't know. Ask him. Because you were. I funny. felt like maybe you'd have a more honest answer. Well, I do have an answer. But I should say it. <laughs> Jean Michel, have you always been such a happy, positive person? And where do Not you think, always. Where do you think you got your positivity? But most from? of the time. I did, thanks to the people who were supporting our mission, our expeditions, our filmmaking. And with that, then we were able to have a mission. And uh, to, by myself, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. It's a teamwork. But I'm trying to lead a little bit, thanks to the name which I've inherited. And I will give it, uh, never give it up because I still want to honor my dad, my mother. My mother was uh, uh, on board Calypso more than my father, my brother, and myself together. She, Can you tell us more about your mom? That's fascinating. Sorry? I'd love to hear more about your mom. Well, my mom was uh, uh, the daughter of an admiral of the French, uh, the French uh, uh, Navy. Uh, Navy, and they were based in different parts of the world, and he was in uh, Japan at some point. And uh, then later on, he uh, went and had a big job in Paris. Uh, and uh, that's where my mother and my dad got together, and my dad just loved her. And uh, I was there when they went to get married mm -hmm. because I was born. And uh, thanks to her, wait, wait, back up. Huh? Don, Don raised his eyebrows. Don, well, <laughs> you were there. There's a story there. You got married because you were already born. No. I was going to say, that's pretty French. Isn't that what he said? <laughs> Maybe. Yes, I did. I saw your reaction to that. <laughs> but you have, I think he went to the place where they were married. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I wish them. Yeah. And I have... Uh, With three translators. Beautiful <laughs> images. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a privilege. And I didn't know when I was a kid. I had no idea. And that's when my dad was uh, in the French Navy, ultimately. Uh -huh. uh, he was based down in Toulon, which is one of the main naval base of the French country. And uh, that's where uh, my brother and I, we were born in Toulon. Uh, and then during the Second World War, we moved up on the hills and we lived there for quite a while. What was your mom like? What was her temperament like? My mom was the first woman diver on the planet wow and my was testing the equipment up in paris uh in the 40s dad <laughs> told him okay now you can try the equipment <laughs> and she sent, he sent her in the river which is called la marne uh -huh. and uh, she went and she was the first woman scuba diving wow and uh, my dad sent her there because that river is always polluted and uh, he didn't want to go there. He wanted my mother to be polluted. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. she came out. And uh, that's when ultimately she decided to move on board Calypso. Yeah. And she, stand, uh, she spent more time on Calypso than my father, my brother, and myself together. That was her home. And the crew who was gone, and you remember that, when the crew was gone, uh, for two, three, four months without having any connection with their family. My mother was where they would confide and ask questions and so on and try to uh, get a haircut, survive and support uh, being isolated like that from their family because they didn't know what they were going to find when they came back. Uh -huh. And, you know, it was great. And she, she was a... Uh, she was a treasure for a lot of people. Do you agree? She was a real Cousteau. 
unlike her husband and her son. Let's <laughs> 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 see. Yeah, I had to put up with this guy. Well, yeah, she was great. She was dying. Always there, like you said, always there. <laughs> My parents both <laughs> loved and like adored her. Oh, your dad? The, yeah. Oh, yeah. Both parents. Oh, yeah. both. Mom and dad. On the topic, though, of putting up with people, why did you guys ever let my dad into the Cousteau circle? <laughs> why did my dad, how did, I, I know the story, but I always think it was amazing. It was an amazing gift you all gave him. Your dad was one of the nicest human beings on the planet. And curiosity <laughs> was uh, not only to help everything we wanted to do, but he wanted to be part of and discover and going places which inspire them. And he has been helping us, my dad and the team and me and Ocean Futures nonstop. And I can tell you, I don't, I don't know, you probably don't even know. But see, my business card, mm -hmm. he printed those. And, and that was brochure. a gift for us. And the letterhead, and a book. Look, and I'm, I'm talking about back in the day when he was young, you know, Don, I'm sure you had to, well, he never you had to take my dad diving, which to me is just like oh, a I, headache. Well, I had, <laughs> I had spent a lot of time with your father. Uh -huh. And there's one thing I can disagree with you on is that he was not a cowboy. We yeah. were on mules <laughs> in Sea of Cortez, <laughs> riding across the ridges. And for some reason, my mule took a shining to his mule. He kept biting oh, no. it, and the, his mule would just jump through the kept the yeah. Yeah, and all that, which is the uh, jumping cactus, yeah. yeah, cactus and all. That. <laughs> and he'd come back with cactus all over his arm and swearing at me and everything else, but uh, he couldn't control his mule. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. I mean, you, T Timmy, that's that's where I wanted to go. I I kept thinking about my interactions with your father. And I, I met Timmy's father when I was 16 years old. Mm. And he was like bigger in life to me. He was one of my father's best friends. And he had just started uh, maybe two years after that uh, with the Cousteau Society. Um, they have, uh, or, or have meeting, uh, meeting Jacques Cousteau. And I just wanted, do you have any like story of Tim like fumbling through something beyond the cactus uh, because he would always come back and he would he would relay these stories and everything always went well for him <laughs> and I know that's not the case. Was on when they got like their episode about the day. He uh, this is not for Timmy to hear, but he fumbled <laughs> a lot throughout his whole life with the Cousteau. Come <laughs> on, Timmy, put your hand, put your fingers. Some of it, we let him in, yeah. we let him on to it, you know, <laughs> let him into it. Uh, um, but he was always fun to make make fun of, and he was always a great guy to have around. Yeah. yeah. He knew what he was doing, he was very helpful, and uh, it was nice to have him there. You were telling a story the other day about how he was trying to find some food in a town and oh, when yeah. you are in Brazil. Yeah, we were in some place, I don't know, off the Amazon River, and Three or four of us were in this town looking for a restaurant and uh, he disappeared. And we figured out oh, I must be in this building here. And we walked in and it was him sitting down trying to order food, but it was the lady's house. It wasn't a restaurant. Leave. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, one of many things. And, uh, don't tell that story because his mother. I mean, his his wife, who's a saint, she's listening to you. Oh, well, she! I'm sure she knows a story. <laughs> I imagine she's laughing just as hard as I am about that. <laughs> yeah. Did she say? I. She's laughing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, we have a we have a bunch of questions. First, I just want to tell everybody to move on to the third pose. There's a lot of options to pick from, so um, keep going with all of this, and don't forget to tag at at future ocean society at no. ocean at ocean future society please at ocean future society sorry about that yeah please be sure to tag uh when you it it helps us get more guests on the show support the people that support the show so please tag at ocean future society well we we've uh made some legal things so that's why it's important mm -hmm. to be very specific mm -hmm. it's just like 
using my name. It has yeah. Jean-Michel Cousteau, mm -hmm. uh, same size, same font, and so on. So there's no confusion mm -hmm. with the past. Yeah. And uh, that's been very, very helpful. Well, I think it's always amazing the times that I've spent with you. You are so focused on the future and moving forward. Yeah. And not sitting in the past or just kind of resting on the past. Well, the past, we're having fun. Yeah. And sharing information. And we're live. Right? And we're learning <laughs> and we're la laughing because many of the things we thought was uh, the information we needed to know is much better now than it used to be, thanks to scientists, ecology, uh, discoveries, and studying. I mean, that's it's amazing. Technology. Yeah. Technology. And technology, yeah. Cassandra, we'd love to hear some of those questions if you have them lined up. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, for, first off, uh, one woman, Terry, she just said, thank you for your dedication to the land. Much gratitude. I've been a diver since 1985. It was amazing. What was the most incredible for you? And then she also added that her aunt dived with your father. Her aunt dived with Jacques. Oh, wow. Wow. Diving Where? was my dad. No. She, she's saying her aunt went diving with your father, and she's asking you one of your most memorable experiences. Diving. Thank you, Holly. You're welcome. Who, me? Yes. You. Yes, you. What memorable oh, moment? It's being uh, just one. Going, there's so many stories that I can go. Uh, we went down to, uh, I remember, 90 feet, and uh, I was looking at things, and he had left, and uh, I went, what do am I supposed to do now? Because it's very deep. Uh -huh. And uh, he was at 60 feet. And uh, ultimately, I was looking around and I saw him. Oh, he was way up there. And I said, OK, that's where I should go and stop. Uh -huh. And I started learning about decompression. And thanks to this guy who has kept uh, thousands of our divers over mm -hmm. the last 50 years alive because we're learning about uh, what to do when you go diving and uh, enjoying yourself, right? Right. You're turned on. What? Underwater, most memorable moment, if there is one that comes to your mind immediately. My most memorable moment with Captain Cousteau was when I was on Calypso, the phone rang, I answered the phone, and Captain Cousteau was on the other end. He says, this is Madame Cousteau's husband. I hear that she's mad at me. I said, yes, she is. You should not come on board. And he says, I don't care how much it costs, whatever she wants, give it to her. That's my most memorable. <laughs> I did say underwater, but I guess that was topside. <laughs> yeah. It probably felt like you're underwater. Uh, any other questions, Cassandra? Oh, no? a ton, a ton. How do you decide, this is from Carter, how do you decide on which locations of marine life to focus on, sharing when planning expeditions and films? So, yeah, so how, guess, do you, how do you decide what to focus in on? Well, somebody comes up with a place, usually it's a Cousteau. Um, <laughs> then a team of researchers does the research on it and starts digging into what's there what needs to be filmed, what's a good story, what isn't a good story, <laughs> based on the time of year, the climate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before the team even gets there. Um, and then once we are there and spending sometimes months, there's a thing called go-backs where we didn't get everything we wanted. So we had to go back again, which makes it more costly. Um, so it's not easy, but again, it's, it's technology, which Jean-Michel and his father, Redesigned cameras. Cameras used to be mounted on your shoulder to film above water. They made them cigar, cigar shaped so you could swim them underwater. Um, that's with a 16 millimeter. And Jean Michel went and converted a 35 millimeter the same way um, for the big screen, big shows that we did. So a lot of it was, uh, you know, technology and better and better lenses. And a good portion was patience. You have to be, have a lot of patience with wildlife. Amazing that you mentioned that because it's because of 35 millimeter that uh, where we, wherever we were in the South Pacific, wherever, I had to fly with the roll of 35 millimeter to Los Angeles to have it processed 
and to have the technicians make a copy of it so we could see the images which were proje projected on the big screen. And uh, I had to make a report to see if it was good or not good or if we needed to do it again and so on. That's, that's how it started. And that's how uh, many, many of my father's shows were uh, produced on the expedition and co-produced and edited and finalized in Los Angeles and then sent to wherever on the planet. Mm -hmm. That's how it started in those days. And uh, that's when I got connected because, you know, I was doing what I was told to do. Mm -hmm. So when I couldn't dive, I had to carry all that stuff on the plane so my father could stay back and dive and uh, I was being punished. A lot of my more modern times with the, with Jean Michel and Don, it was using the technology just recently uh, made to then film marine wildlife that we otherwise were not able to film. So one of the most recent films is an IMAX film, Secret Ocean 3D, and it was using a a camera that was able to film animal marine wildlife the size of your fingernail and really bring it to life in a 3D dimension. So once we had the technology, we were looking at animal behavior we have never, we had never seen before. So a lot of times it's what um, the technology gave us that opportunity. We had one last special to do with PBS and Jean-Michel came to myself and the research team. I wanna do it on killer whales. So we had the luxury of being able to just to Google killer whale biologists what behavior of orcas do we know? What hasn't been filmed? Who are good storytellers? And it took us to five different countries around the world, filming 12 different scientists. Each scientist really just talking from the heart about their love and passion for orcas and their research to really give us a sense of just the complexity of the society of orcas. And for Jean-Michel, that's his favorite animal in the ocean. So it's pretty fun when the Cousteau, Jean-Michel comes up with a pretty good idea. We get to do all <laughs> the work to, uh, Dawn gets all the equipment there on location. Sometimes the container ship yeah. gets delayed <laughs> yeah, and no. we have to make do with what we have. Um, yeah, a lot of challenges, but extremely rewarding when some of our original dreams come to, to fruit. Well, it's been uh, a privilege. Mm -hmm. and uh, I will never stop and I want to continue sharing and as long as I have access and the support of our team will never never give up that's amazing and that's so inspiring to hear is there um, something you haven't seen yet that you're still hoping to see in the ocean yes what have what are you still hoping to see in the ocean Jean-Michel Oh, <laughs> new species, Is which I've never seen. What about a species that's been discovered, but you haven't seen yet and you really want to see? Well, of course. Which, which one? one? Which for, one? Me, for me, it's a narwhal. Oh, oh that'd be awesome. I've never seen a narwhal. <laughs> oh. So what is an animal you know about, but you've never personally seen and you want to just kind of be in its presence? There's so many Sean. species. <laughs> There are many species that I want to no sharks, no. see behaving. I've behave seen everything. <laughs> so I've seen everything. Everything to no, be seen. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. Oh, liar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to push you over a boat. All right, there's one thing I haven't seen, and I dove all around. Um, oh, boy, where's the Great Barrier Reef? Australia. Australia. Mm -hmm. I drove around all around Australia, but I've never been diving on the Great Barrier Reef. Oh. And I don't, oh, I don't really? particularly miss it at all. Well, you should tell me. Because... I've been to a lot of nice places that have to be as good, if not better. Probably. Great Barrier oh. Reef can't be that good. I had the privilege <laughs> to dive all the way around Australia. So did I. But so I didn't hit the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is only... We did. We did. Well, yes, you did. I didn't. I will take you there. <laughs> <laughs> I will take you there. Huh. All right. LAX, left yeah. PM. I'm ready, like to... I'm ready anytime. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a, a favorite place to, like, do you each have a favorite place to dive? Favorite place to dive? The next one. 
No, but <laughs> I love it. If somebody asks you a great location to go diving, what do you well, say? It depends what you want to do because you have to have the right equipment if it's in a uh, warm environment uh, or in cold environment. You're going to see different species, different behavior, depending on where you go. So it's a choice. And for me, that's why I always say the next dive. But uh, of course, very comfortable to be in the warm environment. And uh, we'll take you to uh, the warm water of Australia. Hmm. Yeah, it's warm over there. I would say both of them would say Fiji. They're just not <laughs> wanting to say it right off the top. <laughs> Well, my my greatest side of that, my next one, my number one is two motos, oh, okay. where I think Holly, Jean Michel, and I were down at 200 feet in a night dive. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The yeah. bottom was carpeted with sharks. We couldn't even put our feet down. Yeah. Another place was New Guinea, clearest water ever seen anywhere in, in the world. Another place was Yap, um, where there are... Um, Manta rays with a 12 foot ring, wingspan. Wow. And they come in this cove where there's four cleaning stations. And you can literally reach up and touch them. They're that far, that, that close to you. Oh my gosh. And, uh, then, of course, probably my favorite place now is this place we call uh, Grand Central Station in wow. Fiji. Yeah, yeah. Which we dove there for years oh, yeah. along a wall. But one day we didn't plan the currents right and got sucked down to this plateau. And as we looked around, we were in the midst of school after school of different fish, different types of fish. And uh, that became Grand Central Station. It's interesting that you're saying this because Fiji for me is a destination, so much so that there is a result that bears my name. But this guy has been in charge of all the diving operation and that's where I, we go there with my better half, with Nan and friends and so on. We go out there and uh, we go diving. And I have a very emotional experience there because there is a place where we go with the boat about an hour ago. Namena. To Namena, yeah. And uh, there is a place where there is a grouper. And it's a female grouper that lived in one place. And... Uh, when I went over there and I, the grouper is not there, I go, oh, no. Well, scientists tell me, well, she had to go because they go to a place where the male and the female get together to mm -hmm. uh, give uh -huh. and to give birth. Mm -hmm. And then they, they come back to the place where they live and they don't move. Wow. They stay there. And I, I love to go back to see my friend, the grouper. Mm -hmm. Now, this was many years ago. Uh, maybe she's gone, but uh, maybe she's replaced, maybe by one of her children. I have to say that, um, so Fiji, I think is one of my favorite too, but because of Don and Jean-Michel, the locals who just have such admiration for them took on at a community level to then protect the area in front of the Jean-Michel Cousteau Fiji Resort as a marine protected area. And they, they know in the Fijian culture that when you set aside a place in nature, how resilient nature is and how quickly it recovers. And so part of their tradition is when a local chief passes away, they close off a reef for 100 days and 100 nights. And they see the benefit of that. They then all take advantage of that benefit of how quickly fish could recover fish population. So because of Jean-Michel and Don's influence there for gosh, 25, almost 30 years, um, they now have more of a permanent marine protected area knowing that the local community gets the benefit from the spillover. And when a film team came to Jean-Michel about wanting to make an IMAX, some good friends from France, the Montellos, Jean-Michel, the first place he said was Fiji. So about a third of the IMAX film, Secret Ocean, was filmed at Namena at Grand Central Station because of the just diversity of life. And to add on, because that's what I love to share from what we get to share with the general public is Thank you. the coral reefs are the most diverse ecosystem on our planet from an artistic perspective. Um, I just see so many beautiful pieces of art of the coral reef because it does have about 25% of the biodiversity of our world's oceans are found on these tiny little coral reefs around the world. It only covers less than one-tenth of one percent of our planet, these coral reefs. 
But yet today it is one of the most threatened ecosystems. So from these living experiences, we hope to motivate people to not only go see it for themselves, but to know that there's daily choices they could make, whether they live in California, Kansas City, wherever around the world, that we could all be a part of protecting the world's ocean and especially places like Nemena Island and the coral reefs. No, you're right. Thank yeah. you. Thank what you. are some of those daily decisions that we can do to help then? Um, with, well, Don, can I, I'll just put Don on the spot, maybe just tell us a little bit about your, your, your carbon footprint at home. <laughs> carbon footprint at home. Well, we, uh, from day one, I bought solar panels, put those in. Uh, there's gutters on every roof of my house. So I connected those all together into two 1500 gallon water tanks. Um, I have an electric car and my wife has an electric car. So the solar panels charge those. We uh, well, have composting areas there. We have garden trash that gets picked up by the local, whatever it is, Marburg company and uh, turned around and then sold back to the people for mulch, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's all pretty useful, pretty sustainable. Um, same with glass and bottles and plastic and all that's all been recycled there too. So what's your electricity bill? Uh, my electricity bill this last month was minus $66. <laughs> that's good. No, it's amazing. Um, and going to his place is a pleasure because you are uh, contributing to much less pollution. <laughs> the simple things, the simple things is using less single use plastic. We're out on the ocean all the time. We see a tremendous amount of marine debris. That's right. It's just an exponential growth of plastic and plastic is around everything, is in everything. Long term plastic is needed in, in many of our products, but single use plastic we could easily replace with more of a biodegradable material. So that's a huge, simple, solvable solution to one of the biggest threats facing the health of the ocean. And then sustainable seafood. What seafood do you like to eat? How is it harvested? Um, we know we are overfishing our world's oceans at an industrial scale. We are removing a tremendous amount of ocean wildlife in just really the last 25, 50 years. I think if Jacques Cousteau could see today what we're doing to the world's oceans, he would be quite saddened how much bycatch and overfishing is happening in our world's ocean. So, you know, when we buy frozen fish at a big store of a Costco type store, it's contributing to a, a unfortunate situation that's fairly unregulated and illegal. Much of it is illegal. Um, so I think knowing your local seafood or buying locally and sustainable seafood is, is really, really important. So those, those are a couple of simple things. We need to focus on uh... Uh, farming some of those species. Some of them, not everything can be farmed. Jean-Michel and, and, and Don, Don suited Jean-Michel and I up in dry suits and pushed us into a salmon farm in British Columbia. And that was a pretty depressing sight to see. So fishing in the ocean, is, farm fishing in the ocean isn't a solution, but Jean-Michel works closely with a professor researcher on the East Coast who's doing these closed contained fish farms in Florida so well one of the things that I become hyper aware of when I'm on the coast and you know it's something that Gianna and I do is when we buy something we say is this future trash oh right and because you start to realize when you are on the ocean you start to see where a lot of it all goes and how everything is all connected um and I think that sometimes these conversations can feel very dark they can feel very hopeless and I really do believe that we all have a micro choice to, to believe in positivity, believe in change. And um, that is the only way to have macro yes. effects. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, we, we have a lot of young students that are, have tremendous anxiety about these things. And one of the things that I would echo, and I think that it's something that I've probably heard from you, is that kind of every voice counts mm -hmm. and a mic micro changes make a macro difference. Yeah, absolutely. And every species in the ocean or on land is the capital 
-hmm. and uh, it produces, and you can take the interest produced by the capital, but the minute you remove the capital, mm -hmm. no reproduction taking place, and ultimately it goes bankrupt and it weakens the whole system. Every time we lose a species, the system becomes, uh, mm -hmm. is having a very hard time. So we can only take the interest produced by the capital. We have, through Jean-Michel and Ocean Future Society, we have a wonderful education program, and it's uh, ambassadors of the environment, because yeah. we're instilling a sense in kids to be the ambassador. So it's all about sustainability and using nature as an example. Oh, it's Nancy. Voyage to, Voyage to Curry. Yeah. So yeah. using using nature as our teacher and engaging kids to not only have that sense of curiosity, their inquisitive nature, but to use these simple principles that there is no waste in nature. Everything runs on energy. It's renewable energy, not with a byproduct of fossil fuels. It's renewable. Biodiversity is good and everything is connected. So when kids feel a part of the solution, then I have great hope. Jean-Michel is always extremely hopeful, especially when he's around a group of kids. And I think they are ecologically much more sensitive than my generation and um, the generations before me. You know what uh, these kids do to me? Mm. They recharge my batteries mm -hmm. because I don't want to give up. And that's how I've been uh, without pointing a finger. Yes, three fingers pointing at you. I try to reach people who can make better decisions. Simple things every day, yeah. And uh, that's how I reached uh, uh, President W. Bush uh, when uh, I made a show that my father wanted to do, which was to- We go. were there. Don was there. I was there. We well, were there. Don't telling your story. Yeah. <laughs> Going from uh, Hawaii, or all the, the uh, Hawaiian islands, all the way 1,200 miles northwest. And uh, we did a show, a two-hour special, and I was fascinated. And uh, ultimately, to make a long story, I was invited to present the show at the White House. And the president invited 50 people to watch the show. And so one to me was very important was uh, his wife, because she asked me questions nonstop. She was sitting right next to me. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the presentation, W. Bush asked me, uh, ask everybody, he said, you can, we can have lunch, uh, follow me, and uh, I'd like to, you can sit next to me. And during the dinner uh, or lunch, uh, he was asking me questions nonstop, and the food was coming and going and coming and going. I never had a chance to eat anything because I was uh, speaking to him. And that's when he decided with his team and so on, to declare the Northwestern Hawaiian Island the largest marine protected area. All I wow. did was to show him the film and to reach his heart. Everybody has one. And I, I was not there to criticize. And uh, he did it. Now, <laughs> amazingly, about eight or nine years ago, we were in uh, Hawaii. And at the big conference over there, I think you were there. Mm, you know? Celine was there. You were there? I, yeah. yeah your, anyway, and we were making presentations and so on. And uh, Obama uh, showed up and he said, I want to see what uh, Bush has done. So he took a plane and he did 1,200 miles and came back. And he had a 200 miles on each side. So they... Republican Democrats have created the largest marine protected area on the planet. And all we have to do is to try to sit down with people and reach them. They have families, they have children. They are the ones that will run the planet tomorrow. And uh, we need to provide them as much information as possible. And the parents want to do that. But we not need to make the bridge between their instant obligations whether it's election or profit, is to uh, think mm -hmm. about what they can do to help the planet and obviously their children. 
So that was um, Voyage to Kure, PBS special. It came out in 2006. And so when it aired nationwide on PBS, John michelle was invited to the White House. Yep. And then uh, President Bush used his executive order and within two months protected a national monument that was the first national marine monument around the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So then President Obama years later flew out to Midway and, that, and then he doubled it. And since then, there are larger marine protected areas now, but oh, at yeah. the time in 2006, it was the largest marine protected area um, by President Bush. That's what are you involved with right now? You're deeply involved in protecting yeah. the ocean. I mean, we protect so little of our ocean. Most people don't realize we literally protect less than 8% of it. So we are mining, we're deep sea fishing, we're industrial fishing, we're polluting. And so I think what Jean-Michel mentioned is just a, a beautiful documentary of us living on a ship for 30 days, 21 of us. Yeah. Uh, you're looking for a picture of that? Oh, right there. That's one, Don. So yeah. we were living on a research vessel. Um, we traveled 1,200 miles from Honolulu up to Kure, which is the island right past Midway. Yeah. And along the way, we were literally diving on coral reefs that had never been explored before. So it was a, a real true okay. Cousteau expedition in that sense. But the sad part of it, we were landing on these very remote islands with tens of thousands of nesting seabirds, the Laysan albatross and black-footed albatross. And many of them would feed out at sea and mistake plastic as food, as squid oh. or fish. So we just saw yeah. so much marine plastic debris on the islands from the birds and a lot of birds that died from ingesting it. So that is what President Bush saw, thanks to Jean-Michel. Um, and it was very inspiring what he was able to do, thanks to you, Jean-Michel, and the well, team for me. making the oh, documentary. Team. Okay, oh, I know, but you had dinner with him. Oh, you didn't he get to eat your dinner because you were so busy talking with him. <laughs> well, he was asking me questions and I was trying to answer while he was eating and I didn't eat, but that's okay. And you know, later on, not a very long time ago, I found out that the president of Mexico was a diver. Oh, President yeah. Zedillo. You got an in. And <laughs> I went to see him and I said, we need to protect the place where the whales go down in Mexico to give birth and take care of their babies. And there are probably 3,000 Mexicans who are taking people on their little boats to mm -hmm. show those whales to visitors. And that's a, how they're making a living, which is fine. And they're not disturbing the whales. Mm -hmm. And uh, I visited that myself and I was fascinated. So I found out that uh, a big industry wanted to create the desalinization plant where those whales are coming. Well, desalinization plant is nothing bad. But that was the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So I went to see Zedillo in Mexico City, and I explained all of that to, to him. And he decided to protect that place, connected with that big industry, and asked them to do this desalinization plant somewhere else. And that's what happened still today. And it's the UNESCO World Heritage Site now. Wow. So it's a pretty big Wow. Thing. And with your father. He wow. was there for the whole thing, too. Wow. And who yeah. fell out of the Zodiac? John, when you guys were, uh, oh, yeah. when the gray whale came right up to the Zodiac, who was the diver that got, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Yikes. Well, I just want to say, first of all, it's amazing having you all on the show. This has been really special. What you've all done is, I think, really inspiring as far as an ambassadorship or diplomacy, understanding people that maybe you don't agree with, but finding a through line and, uh, and I think it's really inspiring uh, as an artist or as a visual storyteller to learn one of the most important things you can do is find a way to connect with other people. And I think what you said is beautiful about they have children, they have families, and everybody wants to continue to, to live in an environment that is, that is healthy and yeah. happy. So thank you so much. This has been so special. Thank you. Like, this has been absolutely amazing. Everyone, like, 
I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but we're all so inspired and just ecstatic to have this opportunity to hear you talk. Wow. I will dig through the questions on Discord and I'll, I'll I'm going to be hanging out with this guy more. So <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get some videos. We'll get some more stuff. And maybe you could, so Sandra, just to say that um, Ocean Future Society is Jean Michel Cousteau's nonprofit uh, marine conservation free organization. So people could follow along on social media as we've already given the and hashtag. Ask questions. Yeah. So um, a great way to kind of stay involved because Jean Michel is really celebrating 78 years of diving. There's nobody, there are older divers. Jean Michel has to remember there are older divers who are older than him, but no one's. Yeah. No, 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 no. There are still divers older than Jean Michel still diving today. No, 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 no. Yes, he disagrees. But wait, 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 wait. wait he is the one who's been diving the longest. The longest, Jean Michel. Oh, yeah. You yeah. probably feel like the oldest. No, I want I want to dive with the old people. A 90-year-old. Okay. Yeah. Well, everybody, we're gonna log off. Um, please, uh, you know, I know that Cassandra is gonna Cassandra is in charge of looking at the images tonight. Um, please post your work. Don't forget to tag at Ocean Future Society. I'm going to be sharing the artwork with these people. We're going to actually let you have food tonight, I think. Well, I want so, people to realize that uh, whether they like it or they already left because they had enough of us, it's all your fault. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Not your dad, whom we love. He was a friend. I will never forget it. And uh, your family is. Super. Thank you for doing this. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, everybody, hey, I, I want to say a thank you also, Jean-Michel, Don, Holly, and Timmy. Thank you for doing this. This means a lot to our community. It uh, means a lot to me. Uh, my father's legacy, uh, Tim and Timmy's relationship, and uh, Jean-Michel and your father. Um, thank you so much. This has really been fantastic. Um, have a great meal. Yeah, thank thank you. you very, very much. I would, I would definitely so make much. Timmy pick that check up, by the way. Um. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. How well, cool that was that? Was epic. I, I couldn't that draw was... anymore. I just stopped. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to lit, watch and listen. I really oh, enjoyed that. Gosh. Just that was everything I hoped it, it to be, you know, and more. Yeah. Thankfully, Timmy didn't screw that whole thing up. I was just awesome. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> that was <me. laughs> How much fun was that? Oh, so oh, cool. Amazing. So cool. And I just thought that that was so inspiring to mention, like, putting differences aside to just discuss what was important, what he accomplished by having that perspective. Like that, that is so beautiful to be reminded of. Yeah, absolutely. And also the fact that he makes me feel really old by, from all the energy that he has. Yeah. Like, it's like, <laughs> whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. That, 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 that's amazing. His clarity, too. I mean, he mm -hmm. hasn't lost me. I saw him five years ago. It was the last time. I've, I've met him a couple of times, and he came to um, uh, Timmy's father's company's 50th an anniversary of when he started it, uh, which was just not long after Tim passed away, and got to spend the evening sitting at the table with him and his wife talking. It was just fantastic. Oh, that's so cool. So cool. So cool. It was like a bucket list moment. Um, everybody, uh, will I have, uh, I have you, uh, can you start posting on Instagram and the algorithm is a little wonky, so we're going to do the best we can. And you've got me doing it tonight. So I apologize in advance because yeah, to me, does it way better and everybody else does it way better. So I will do the best I can on it, but don't forget to um, also like not hashtag, just hashtag, but actually at um, future ocean society. Am I saying it right? I don't want to mess it up. So does it need to be hashtag at or just, or do both? Just at. Yeah. So just actually at tag. At, so just at ocean future society. Yes, actually add it because then people can click on it and see 
what we're talking about and bring more traffic to their site because they want to build up more followership so that we can they can get more information out. So if we can help in that little way, like everybody follow them and let's help like build their numbers because they're doing amazing things. And I will mention, if you go to that website, you you have an opportunity to donate to them. Um, if you can afford it, please do it. This is free to our community, but if you can help them, it's more important. <laughs> yes, for sure. So um, in about, I don't know, what we'll draw another five minutes and then I'll head over there. Yeah, I put the brakes on after the first drawing. I couldn't stop listening. I know I couldn't. I couldn't do any more. Like I was just covering on the same one because I just wanted to hear everything they were saying. To me, to me, that's just such an. I mean, it's a really touching story to me because I remember when they were making the connection, and you know, um, my dad doing those drawings. My dad doing. He did some paintings of Jacques Cousteau. They made prints of it, um, which went to raise money for the Cousteau Society. Um, and then Tim kind of making the connection and, and a, a long-term connection where uh, Timmy's father became the uh, chief uh, financial officer for the Cousteau Society for 25 years, traveled all over the world with him, and pretty amazing. So cool. I'm just going to geek out about that for a long time. Yeah, yeah no, it's like, it, it, oh, so what did you what did you do this Thursday? Uh, I don't know. I just uh, met, you know, uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau and his his team of like legendary divers and marine biologists. It's not a big deal. Anyways, you know, I have to hear how <laughs> we change the world and protecting things. Cool. Not, not a big deal. Yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, man, what other drawing yeah. stream gives you this kind of content? Right. Absolutely. <laughs> And what and and last night I mowed my lawn, you know. So it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> put things in perspective, right? Yeah. Well. Oh man. Gosh. Ah, uh, it's just yeah. It was so cool to see that there were other there were places that even they haven't been to. Yeah. Was, uh, and, and wanting to go to. <laughs> Right. And it's not through lack of trying, folks, you know. I totally wanted to ask if they saw a narwhal in person. So I really appreciate that they brought that up because I'm oh, I'm best fascinated by the unicorns of the sea. I I will it's you get no uh sorry. Hey, go ahead, Bill. I was gonna say I, I was just I I you know while while we were talking, I looked up Holly. He's been diving for 20 years. So tells you that, you know, some creatures are elusive. You know. Yeah. Or right. How long is what 70 years he's been diving? You know, and there's still things that 80. 80. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, you know, 80 years. Yeah. And okay. that'll never happen. I that He's, I mean, that's he's going to be the youngest diver ever, right? I mean, mm -hmm. well, so considering I mean, you have to be, you have to be seven now <laughs> or ten, you or have to ten, be ten. Now. Yeah. <laughs> they've 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 uh, defended his legacy. <laughs> yeah, protected. It's it. these days, it, ten year olds these days got it easy. You know, it's they, they're not strapping on experimental. And equipment. I wanted to say so badly. It's like uh, kids these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's so great. It's fun to hear them bicker a little bit. Yeah, that, that's what Timmy was saying we would get. He said he hoping it hoping it didn't get out of hand because they really uh they really go after each other at times. They're packing me up. It's like, well, you've been there, but I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> Like, like you can tell they have worked together a very long time all of them yeah amazing really amazing and I, I and i i keep going back and it's like me in my teenage years early 20s 
that what I mean, he really was one of the re most recognizable, you know, it was him and Muhammad Ali <laughs> were the two most recognizable men in the in, individuals, people in the world. And, and, you know, knowing that, you know, my father went out, you know, photographed him, uh, went out uh, on the Calypso a couple of times, spent time with him. It's pretty cool. That's, that is the definition of cool. Well, also it's just, saying that his connection to get to Jacques Cousteau was through John Denver, like that, <laughs> I can't wrap my brain around that either. Yeah, <laughs> that was at the time, one of the most popular entertainers in the world. Oh yeah. It's interesting too to think that they were able to put those specials on, get them distributed, you know, all, mostly before the internet i want i right. wanted to ask i wanted to ask a question i i i felt uncomfortable with you know too many questions or asking too many from my perspective but i wanted to ask questions about tim and you know going on expeditions with the Cousteau society for the first time and tim told me some of the most amazing things when he went his first expedition or one of the first major things that he went on was that they took the Calypso up the Amazon. And Tim had this, you know, he got invited to go and he had this like vision in his head that he was going to be on the Calypso doing all <laughs> He was a grunt. He was like one of the first, he, you know, you had to, to earn your red cap uh, to be on that boat. And so he had to walk alongside the boat uh, up the river through the uh, through up the Amazon through the wow. jungle. Can you imagine what that no. was? Like? And, <laughs> and all kinds of crazy things. He got captured. Um, he he had all kinds of just amazing stories of things that have happened to him. And I love captured to just, by he, who? He got captured by natives, and he got put into a he got put in a chicken coop. <laughs> and he he had to barter his way out um oh my god he had to have the right you know they were they weren't interested in money they were interested in like fishing equipment um things that were practical to them um and i just find it really interesting um i go back and i listen to tim telling those stories and it was just like you know it's like listening to this great explorer and he was just on the periphery of it from from the uh from the beginning you know right. actually being there with Cousteau oh my gosh can you imagine I mean just busting into people's homes ordering food <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah I can I can see that I'm with the Cousteau, I'm with the Cousteau Society I want a steak <laughs> right yeah I want a steak I'll have uh Two, two, you know, two ham sandwiches. <laughs> I, you know, it's something I, I, when I heard that, I was like, that I would have totally done that. That would have been me. That would have been me. Tim, I'll tell you, this is one of the funnier stories that Tim told me was that when he first went to the Amazon, he didn't, you know, he was, he was thinking again, he was going to be on the ship and he went to Abercrombie and Finch and bought this safari outfit <laughs> and he said you know he kept saying i look like yukon cornelius in this thing i i you know it's all khaki i have my i have my uh safari hat and everything and i show up and the first thing that everybody's snickering because you know everybody's in shorts and t-shirts <laughs> and this newbie has this you know very expensive Abercrombie and Finch safari outfit and they said when he when he when he wrote when he first got after he'd been on the the ship and they put him uh, he had to go to shore he had to step off an inflatable and into onto the ground and he thought it was solid ground and he stepped into this like pit of mud and just completely went under and he said and, and oh the people God. there were saying the only thing that was left of Tim's safari outfit all they could see was his hat Flow, <laughs> <laughs> but I always have that image in my head thinking of Tim. Okay. Uh, all right. Is it going to work? Ready for this? Yeah. Let's do it.
I see great stuff already. I see, wow, I see oh, AJ. Wow. <laughs> that is That's fantastic. Terrific. Awesome. Okay. Let's pack it up and go home, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, man. <laughs> Thank you for joining tonight. It was a really fun conversation. Um, and then another nice mic. That's great. Oh, I love this so much. That is beautiful. Fantastic. Ooh, good great likeness people. there. Yeah, one of the things we were talking. Uh, you know, just technical stuff at the beginning. And, you know, I, I'm always pushing uh, observational drawing and, and the practice of it, how important it is. And I love the fact that my, my favorite drawers and painters are, you know, they approach observationally and how important it is in likeness. And they can do like distortions. They can make things way out of whack, but they're so well observed they get why that person looks like that person. You know, you see Chris yeah. Payne do a drawing where everything's out of proportion, but it looks exactly like the person. Um, mm. And I think that's just, you know, observing at a very, very high level. Mm -hmm. This Are is we, so good. It's great. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> it's in the water. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Ooh, really good job here. I bet there's a lot of drawings tonight. Oh, look at that. Oh, my oh, yeah. gosh, Gary. Gary. He does a montage. There you go. Holy smokes. This guy. Look at that. You and AJ need to go somewhere. Yeah. Uh, while you're at it, yeah. pick, up, pick up Julian on the way. <laughs> right. Look at, his, look at the know. water that you captured. Gary, that is epic. Look at that, look at that one. Jeez. Yeah, that's fantastic. Dang. Everybody did amazing tonight. Love nice. it. Ooh, Look Xander. That. Oh, that's great. Nice, Xander. Wow. I love the visual arts passage on there. Talk about bonus points. <laughs> it kind, it kind of looks like a, it kind of looks like a logo for a diving it, apparel anyway it does You're right yeah that's very nice we got to save yeah. that we got to put that on our hat i like it yeah oh, oh chuck this is so oh, chuck, well that's done really good oh chuck nice really nice chuck just keeps getting better oh so fun <laughs> nice marcy i really like nice, marcy. marcy i love the blush on the otter yeah oh that's cool oh that's so cool. that. i mean that's a there's a lot to that photo too yeah yeah, yeah. he he's something like, like a jack potter like a yeah. jack potter drawing it's beautiful really direct you really pick the spots Very wow nice. Chuck. Chuck. beautiful Ooh, that's that's cool. fine. Alberta, nice. love it. I had I had all intentions to paint that or to to draw that, and I just couldn't do anymore after they started talking. I know. Same same problem. Great job. Oh, I love this. Very nice. Was that previous one? I I couldn't tell if that Sally. Uh, no, it was like by Sally's. Okay. My cousin's here in God, town. Asia, look at that drawing. I, I haven't seen her because I've been working and she's not that. feeling. That's an nice That's fun. That's really beautiful too. Really great. I haven't seen the AJ line drawing. That was beautiful. Love it. So great. AJ using line. I know. Ooh, love it. Nice. Good color. Yeah, they Ooh, get all that's really nice. There's, there's kind of a mismatch, isn't there? Uh, yeah, the algorithm is just going to be wonky. Sorry, guys. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. Dude. That's powerful. Alberto, amazing. Of course, you don't have our logo in it, so. 
I'm not going to give it a hard time. Branding. Where's the branding? That's yeah. what it's missing. <laughs> Got to be a little quicker, AJ. Ooh, that's Ooh Karen. Cool. Look at that. Karen. It's lovely. Nice. Oh, Felicity. Very nice. I love it. Oh, wow. really? Oh, that's Look at that. Cool. <laughs> Tell so. the story. Nice. That's fun. Really great job. Good drawing. Even corn going by. <laughs> Whoa, look at that one. Jeez. Yeah, nice. Dang, Alberto, you got a lot done tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it is a nice visit. Oh, the previous the algorithm. Wow. Right. Oh, Please. nice one, AJ. Another one. Oh, you got you work fast night too. Nice. Oh, Peter. Nice, Peter. That's Good one, Peter. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I oh, like that one too. That. Uh, That's Nicole. Oh, Jackie, I, I love it. I knew it was yours, Jackie, as soon as that came up. Me too, immediately. <laughs> Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So get back in the kitchen and she knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> If you're all in our class, you would get it. Otherwise, it sounds really wrong. <laughs> <laughs> she does oh beautiful drawings it's, of it's, simple it's so things right. in the kitchen. And we were yeah. encouraging her to stick to it. <laughs> stick to the still lifes. And I kept telling her to go back to the kitchen. <laughs> we wanted to make a t-shirt. Yeah. Oh, I love this, Jeff. That's a great drawing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And Julian's is great. Look at that. Oh I mean, my gosh. Look at that. Wow. Julian, Gary, and um, Alberto, I think, all sort of chose mm -hmm. the same approach for that. And it really worked. Great. Beautiful. Really nice. oh, that's fun. So fun. Do you like that I have control of this? So I'm a slow scroll. Oh, I love <laughs> the whale on the shirt. <laughs> so Sorry, I'm highly entertained by that. Yeah. That's Felicity. Whoa, that was Felicity. Oh man. Yeah. Oh. This is like it. Okay. Right, I think we're at the end of it here. on this day. Oh, well, that's too bad. I know there was more, but very, very well done, everybody. What oh, a wait! Real... Here we go. Oh, oh way to go, Jackie! Go, Jackie. Yeah, that was cool, Jackie. Yeah, I'll see if there's any more. Oh. Nice. You're right. There was definitely more. There was just like a chunk of other stuff. Yeah, there was a lot of people in here tonight. So I figured there would be a lot. That's cool. Oh, nice. Julian. Beautiful. I'm glad you tackled that. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh that's Nicole, cool. I like how you handled too. It. I love yeah. seeing these in a row. Yeah, this is uh, uh, Randy's coming up here. I got a big kick yeah, out of Randy. that. Wow. Nice. Oh, nice. Great drawing. Oh, wow. Nice. Oh, you go, Peter. We got the lovely whale here, Nicole. Oh, that's good. Nice. Nicole. Beautiful, Beautiful silhouette. That's really amazing, nice. Charlotte. Excellent. Really, really great job. <laughs> oh, love it. I just love, there was that spot of red, little teal, little yellow, like boom. Okay. I think that's. I think we got them. Most of them. Excellent. Everybody, because hey, Cassandra, thank you for contributing so much tonight. Um, Ray, Bill, 
always, I really appreciate you drawing with us. And this this was an exceptionally great night. Um, and I know everybody's left, but uh, Holly, Don, uh, Jean Michel, Timmy, Gianna, uh, thank you all for the effort you put into it, and it made for a really fantastic evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Awesome night. Good night.